Thank you, Eran. Uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me and for putting this conference together. It's been a lot of fun seeing people, finally. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about two um, different lines of work that actually uh, intersect at some point. So <clears throat> I will talk about some work with Mario De Marco, Andrea San Giovanni and Valandro. So Mario and Andrea are both in the audience today. They're excellent PhD students, both applying. And I will talk about some upcoming work with Antoine Bourget and Sakura. So the idea is um, trying to understand uh, five-dimensional N equals one SCFTs uh, from the, the paradigm of M-theory on non-compact singular Calabi-L threefolds. Uh, this is a very old idea, back to the 90s. And we have a pretty decent dictionary about geometric data and how it translates into gauge theory data. For instance, we know that deformations uh, roughly correspond to Higgs branch directions. Um, Kähler, you know, resolutions, small resolutions, or uh, large resolutions correspond to either Coulomb branch directions or extended Coulomb branch directions. Uh, it's a very nice dictionary, but as, as I will show, it's incomplete. And we've known for uh, more than a decade that it's an incomplete dictionary. And, and that's a, actually a very interesting opportunity to discover new things, new phenomena. So let me show you some, some examples. If you're familiar with toric diagrams, all these figures represent um, toric Calabi-L threefolds. So for instance, this is the, the diagram for C3. Uh, it is believed to correspond to an, just an empty theory in five dimensions. Uh, this is the famous conifold, which corresponds to free hyper in five dimensions. And this is C3 mod Z3 cross Z3, which gives rise to the so-called E6 SCFT. Now, we know, thanks to work by uh, Hanani, Kohl, Aharoni, and others, that the dual graph to the toric diagram um, can actually be interpreted in a dual type 2B picture in terms of five brain webs. So for instance, this would be a D5, this is an NS5, and this is a 1,1, one, one, a one comma one uh, five brain. And here's the corresponding examples uh, graphs for, for the other two theories. So in this picture, <clears throat> we can see, for instance, some of these moduli, like taking the conifold and adding a line here corresponds to performing a small resolution. In terms of the five brain diagram, it means resolving this cross like so. And we know that this has a geometric meaning so this corresponds to having a non-trivial circle vibration here that gives rise to a sphere. This is the, the small resolution of the conifold. And its Kähler volume corresponds to giving a real mass to the free hyper. People call this extended Coulomb branch for different reasons. We could also take the conifold in algebraic form and deform it at a constant. And this makes it into a smooth variety. In terms of toric diagram, uh, Vafa and others understood that this means lifting, for instance, this line off the page. And now you have a vibration over this interval. And we know that this gives rise to a three sphere. And the, the three sphere could be interpreted as a VEV for the hyper, for the bilinear that you make with the two halves of the hyper. OK, so this is roughly what this dictionary is about. And then we have, there's more intricate cases. Now, when it comes to these five brain diagrams, it was understood uh, already in the 90s that we can bring these semi-infinite uh, intervals to a finite distance by allowing the five brains to terminate on various seven brains. So here, the D5s terminate on uh, D7s, here on 0, 0,1 seven brains, and here on 1, 1, seven brains. And Benini, Benvenuti, and Tachikawa understood that we could do some interesting things with these five brain webs. For instance, you could, you could bring these two close together, like so. And then you could lift off this little segment off to infinity, off the page. This is a partial Higgsing. It's allowed by the so-called S rule. And it leaves you with a different theory, a partially Higgs theory that flows to a new theory. Uh, in terms of toric diagrams, 
what people have, uh, this has been encoded by replacing uh, some of these black dots with white dots. So for instance here, I have merged these two brains such that they end on a single seven brain, and this is codified by replacing this with a white dot. So this concept was introduced by Benini Benvenuti Tachikawa, and people have been working on this extensively, including Antoine Bourget, Sakura, uh, Marike von Beist, and uh, Julius Eckhart. And more generally, I could have, I could approach this third brain, move it up here, so that now three brains terminate here, and this would be represented in the toric diagram by, instead of having a black dot here, then now I have two white dots. More generally, you could have a theory like this, and you, you could codify this information in terms of partitions. So this would be the one, 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 this would be the two, one, one, and so on, in terms of how many brains terminate, how many five brains terminate on a seven brain. And there's a nice so-called uh, structure, a hierarchy known as a Hasse diagram, and this, this can be codified in terms of these graphs, but now you might ask, and this is a question that's been asked a lot, what is the geometric interpretation of these white dots, uh, other than just bookkeeping devices? So I'll give a spoiler alert in case the chairman is, uh, does not allow me to finish in time, <laughs> if I go over time. The spoiler is that these things are so-called T-brains. Uh, I will explain what they are. Uh, these things were introduced by um, Sharp and Gomez in a different language, and then later were elaborated by Kamran, Jonathan, Chicotti, and Clay Cordova. And, uh, and I'll get into that later, but first I'll explain how we uh, approach this problem. So I gave you a picture in M-theory on a Calabia threefold and type 2b with five brain webs. But there's an intermediate peak picture that is what actually allows to trace these dualities, which is the type 2a picture. And uh, when you can make the setup perturbative in type 2a, you can learn a lot about these things. And this, is, this will be my strategy. So let me explain how this goes. If you have a toric Calabial threefold, by definition, it has an algebraic torus, uh, C star to the cube, acting on it. One of these is singled out because it, 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 uh, it gives you the cone direction of this threefold, but the other two can be thought of as acting on the planar graph that I showed you uh, that encodes a toric threefold. Now, because these C stars contain circles, uh, the toric threefold is, is, is a double C star vibration, if you will, over something. You can choose a circle and decide that that's your M-theory circle and reduce the type to A. Now, in general, these C star fibers will collapse, so it'll look something like that. You'll have a vibration over a local K3. You'll have C star fibers like that, and they will collapse over the low key where we have D6 brains in type 2A. That's the interpretation. So in other words, I'm gonna be looking at cases where the threefold can be reduced to type 2A on a local K3 plus D6 brains. Any questions? All right. So let me give an example of how this is done diagrammatically. You can find this in the really nice paper of uh, Michele del Zotto, Cyril Closet, and uh, Vivek Saxena. Take this toric diagram here, which represents C3 mod Z3 cross D3. The reduction to type 2A gives you, you just project the toric graph, and this is nothing other than C2 mod Z3. So it's a local K3, it's an A2 K3. It has the, it has two exceptional sphere, two vanishing spheres that I, I represented here with these lines. And it has a non-compact holomorphic curve on this side. And what you do is you look, in this projection, you look at how many dots are above each point. So for instance, here I have one dot, here I have two, here I have three, and you label the projected dots by that number minus one. So here, zero, one, two, three. And then in type 2a, what happens is that you simply say that here there's a sphere that has one D6 brain wrapping it, here there's two D6 brains wrapping it, and here on the non-compact cur curve there are three D6 brains. So at weak coupling limit, at weak gauge coupling, this is interpreted 
as what one would call SU1, SU2, with three flavors. This is the quiver. And in the ultraviolet, at the SCFT point, this is known as a T3 theory. Okay, so that's how it's usually done for these theories. <clears throat> and what I will do, hopefully by the end of the talk, is explain what it means to put a white dot here or here or both in terms of what happens on these D6 brains. So my claim will be that we're activating what is known as a T brain, which is non-abelian data up here. Okay, so now I will switch gears and tell you a different parallel story, and then hopefully the two stories will merge. So do you have questions about this so far? All right. So now we'll talk about flops. Okay, so we, we heard a, a lot about them in the beginning of the week. Um, I will take a different approach to that. So let me explain to you the conifold. Everybody's seen the conifold or will have seen the conifold depending on your age. Uh, the conifold is the simplest kind of threefold singularity, non-compact, and it has a beautiful group theoretic uh, explanation. It can be thought of as a family of A1 uh, Duval surfaces, or K3s. But how do we see this gauge theoretically? And take type 2A, just on flat C2, on flat space time, and you put two uh, parallel D6 brains, the uplift is known to be, to M theory, is known to be C2 mod Z2. In terms of the diagrammatic projections I showed you before, this would be the toric graph for Z2, C2 mod Z2 times a trivial factor of C. This would be the projection to type 2A. This graph represents C2 space. This is just a trivial K3. And it has two uh, D6 brains on a non-compact directions, okay? Now, what is the theory on these D6 brains? It's 7D super young mills, in this case with SU2 uh, gauge group. The vector multiplet contains uh, three scalars, a complex one and a real one. And what you can do is activate a non-trivial position-dependent VEV for phi. So if we take this direction here to be the complex W direction, and you activate a, a position-dependent VEV W minus W, it corresponds to giving an angle to the two D6 brains. So now you're breaking 7D n equals 1 to 5D n equals 1 super young mills. In this case, the SU2 is broken to its carton, and all you're left with is a hyper. How do we see this in terms of M theory, geometry? It's a very beautiful story. You have a spectral equation. So you add two directions, two fiber directions, UV, and you set UV equals to the characteristic polynomial of the VEV of this vector multiplet complex scalar. So when this thing is zero, this term is absent, and all you have is UV equals Z squared, which is, which is the K3, C2 mod Z2. But when you activate this VEV, you add this position-dependent deformation, and this is the conifold. Now, the conifold has a vanishing sphere, and these open strings uplift to M2 brains wrapping this vanishing sphere, and they give rise to a, a 5G hyper. How can we compute the fact that there's one hyper purely in terms of gauge theory data? Well, this, this is a very old type of calculation. What you do is you look for fluctuations of the complex scalar modulo linearized gauge transformations. So commutators of the background phi with some arbitrary two by two matrix. So in this case, delta phi has a charge zero bit under the carton, a plus charge and a minus charge thing. And it's defined up to an addition of something like this. What we learn from this is that the phi zero piece is a 7D mode. It's not dynamical in five dimensions, but the five, phi plus, phi minus, they're defined up to the ideal W, which in algebraic geometry tells you that these are modes that live on the W equals zero. They live on the W equals zero locus, so they live really at the intersection here. 
So it's a, it's a, so it, so together they form a hypermultiplet in 5D, and there's exactly one. So with this logic, we deduce that the, the Gopakumar Vafa invariant for the conifold at genus zero, my goodness, at genus zero is one. So the Gopakumar Vafa invariants they count BPS states in M theory for M2 brains wrapping various curves. So that's the simplest possible case of what we call a simple flop of length one. Now I want to give, uh, introduce, well, not introduce, because that, that was Reed, uh, Miles Reed did it, but I want to introduce to you uh, a well-known family of geometries. So I told you that the conifold could be thought of as an, a family of A1 surfaces. Now you can look at a family of A2K minus one surfaces. And so let's, let's, take, let's take A3 as a simple example, a working example. So start with four uh, parallel D6 brains. So that's again 70 super young mills with SU4. And activate a nilpotent VEV like so. This VEV breaks SU4 to SU2. The spectral equation for the up theory, M theory uplift because phi is no potent, there's no Casimir variance. So you just have uv equals z to the fourth. So this is just the orbifold c2 mod z4 in type 2a. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in uh, m theory. This is a pure t brain. What we will do is add something to the no potent in the Slodovy direction for those who know about this vocabulary. If you don't, don't worry about it. We add a position dependent part to this VEV. This could be diagonalized morally, albeit in non-holomorphic ways. What this does is it creates an angle like this, so that now the brains are grouped in two here and two there, but it's not just giving them an angle. The fact that this is nilpotent means that these two brains are bound together. It's a non-abelian bound state, and these two are bound together in a certain way. The spectral equation tells you that the up, uplift is this thing, and this is what is known as Reed's Pagoda. It's a type of geometry that has a single vanishing sphere, like the conifold, uh, but with very different properties. If you repeat this calculation of looking at fluctuations of this to count how many five-dimensional hypermultiplets you have from these open strings, you will find that there are two hypers. Uh, so here, I have two free parameters, for instance, in this case, A and B, and they're defined modulo W, so, so they live at this intersection again. From this, our conclusion is that physically, the Gopakumar Vafa invariance of this geometry at degree one, genus zero, must be two. We can repeat this for the general pagoda of degree K, so this geometry, again, by playing this game of choosing a nilpotent orbit and going in a slot of direction. In terms of group theory, you could look at it like this. Take the A2K minus one Dinkin graph. What we are doing here is creating a threefold such that only the central node of this graph will give rise to a vanishing sphere, and the other ones will not. So the resulting geometry is still gonna look kind of like the conifold, something like that, you know, you have something that's cone-like and it emits a small resolution. There's a single sphere. The normal bundle is not O minus one plus O minus one, it's actually O minus two plus O, but it gives rise to a hyper because it's, it's actually a rigid sphere. It's obstructed at higher order. And the Gopakumar Vafa invariance is K in this case. So even though you have one sphere, you have K hypermultiplets. Now, this story in this paper that I'm presenting can be generalized to the whole ADE uh, classification. For instance, I could take, <clears throat> I could take the E6 Dinkin diagram, and I could say I wanna make a family of E6 surfaces such that the, the full threefold only has one vanishing sphere that comes from the central node of the Dinkin graph, okay? So how do you do that? Well, one way is you look at the very first paper of the archive from 1992 by Morrison Katz, 
and Dave will tell you many times that it's the very first paper of the archive. Uh, <laughs> they came up with a way, in principle, of doing this, <clears throat> but it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly complicated way. It requires a mastery of violin variant functions uh, under non-abelian vial groups, because E6 has a non-abelian vial group. And it took many, many years for people to come up with examples and my claim today is that we have a much easier, more economical way of doing this. So how am I doing with time, by the way? Lots of time. Wow, okay. I'm faster than I expected. Okay, so, so how does this work? So again, I, I'll, I'll repeat. I want to have a family, a one-parameter family of E6 surfaces such that at the origin of this family, the full surface is singular, but I want the full family to only have a singularity that admits a small resolution for this sphere only and not the other ones. So what we do is we, we pick the root corresponding to that, and we look at its dual in the Cartan subalgebra V6. Now we look at the Levy subalgebra of this thing, which means essentially the commutant of this element of the Cartan. The commutant in this case will be, oops, will be A2. So for instance, A2 here, plus A2, plus A1, plus the carton itself. So all I need to do now, according to our procedure, is to specify three VEVs for the Higgs, for the Higgs fields in these directions. And what I will do, our prescription is to choose the maximal nilpotent orbit along each of these subalgebras, and then <clears throat> to pick a slow to be sliced direction. So that means a direction transverse to this maximal nilpotent orbit, such that it's position dependent. So in this case, that means putting a W here. We, this is arbitrary. We chose W minus W minus 3W. <clears throat> then we plug, in, we plug this into some machinery some group theoretic machinery. We rewrite this in terms of generators of E6. And we can find the Casimir invariance of this, because now they're non-zero. <clears throat> and what we find is this surface. And this surface is kind of like a conifold. It has, again, a single vanishing P1 that can be small resolved, that corresponds to this P1 of the fiber. Now, this, this curve is what we call, th this uh, threefold is what we call a flop of length three. The P1 in question has normal bundle O minus three plus O1. Uh, but again, this is misleading because it would seem to suggest that the P1 is mobile because it has a positive direction in the normal bundle, but it's actually obstructed at higher order. So it gives rise to hypermultiplet. What does it mean to say that it's of length three? Now, there's a mathematical definition that I will spare you. I will give you a physical definition. So let me motivate this with the conifold. If you had the conifold and you were asked, what is the BPS quiver? Or if you probe the conifold with a point like brain, what would be the quiver of fractional brains? And the quiver would be something like this. Two arrows here, two arrows there, you've probably seen it. And here you would have something like U1 and U1, and some relations. This is the, the quiver of the conifold. When you have a flop of length 3, the quiver will be something that has U1, U3, and a bunch of self-arrows. And in general, for the notion of length L, you will have a node of degree 1 and L. What does that imply for us physically? It implies that, <clears throat> that this threefold admits membranes with charges of higher, um, with higher charges under the surviving carton U1. So this, this, um, this choice of VEV here breaks the original E6 that I would have had in 7D to a five-dimensional theory where only a U1 survives, a flavor symmetry of U1. And under this U1, I can have states of degree of charge 1, 2, and 3. 
And with this gauge theoretic method, so by studying fluctuations of this Higgs data, we can count how many states there are. So there's six hypers of charge one, three of charge two, and one of charge three. And this matches right on the nose with the Gopakumar Vafa invariance uh, for this threefold, which is known. Okay. So the same can be repeated for E7, E8. And you can do even more complicated things with this technology, like instead of just having one vanishing sphere, you could have a bunch of vanishing spheres in any configuration you like, and the whole machinery is entirely group theoretic. So, <clears throat> right. So now the point is that this, all of these varieties that I'm describing to you, so certainly the, the ones based on exceptional groups, but even the pagoda, which started with um, an AN type group, they're all non-toric. So none of the usual techniques like the topological vertex or any of that works for this stuff. But now we know how to, do, how to deal with these things, okay? Now I will switch back if there are no questions. Are there questions? No, all right. Now I will revert back to the original story about white dots. Yes? Yeah. So how come we're not in the mass How come we're not? Sorry, so you're saying for, I could have obtained the conifold by starting with the affine A1 quiver added mass deformations like Klebanov Witten did originally, and I would have ended up with a conifold quiver with the appropriate relations, right? So you could see this. So, I mean, here, I guess the equivalent would be to start with the uh, E6, affine E6 quiver, like for 3dn equals 4 and added some deformations, although it hasn't been done in this language to my knowledge. And if I do it appropriately, uh, well, more things need to be done, things called contractions. Uh, it's been done by mathematicians, which essentially gets rid of some nodes. And these self arrows appear kind of out of nowhere. So what happens is you have the three here, and you have, say, a one here, and these other nodes get they kind of get assimilated, and a whole bunch of these hypers will become, they become future self-arrows. That's how it works. Was that your question? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. This has a horrendous super potential. It's been worked out. So with our method, we don't, we don't come up with, I mean, we're not deriving the quiver, the super potential in, with this method. At least we don't, maybe it's possible, we don't know. Now I, just, I was just presenting it to motivate what it means to be of higher length in physical terms. Sorry? The, I don't know if it's possible, maybe. I mean, it would have to do with, uh, well, in part, yes. I mean, it has to do with the inability to give a VEV to the third scalar uh, in certain directions, because that's what it means to resolve. So maybe one could see that these VEVs generate a potential for this. So, I mean, we can see that, um, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm mixing things up. No, no, you're talking about obstructions not to blowing up, but to moving the curve, right? Huh, I don't know, that's a good question. It would also be interesting to see how do you even detect that the normal bundle has become O minus two plus O. This is also something I'd like to know just from this group theoretic data? Yeah, that's a good question. Sure, any more questions? All right, yeah? No, all right. Okay, so now I would like to revert back to the story of white dots that I started with. So the, what I just presented with the higher length flops, it, it, so it's a work on its own, but it can also serve as, as a, as an example, as a simplified example, ah, well, the AN examples I gave you can be seen as precursors to, to this stuff. But of course, not the exceptional cases that I showed you. So let's go back to this. Let's take, so let me remind you, let's take this geometry, which as I said, is, is in M theory. So this corresponds to C3, uh, C3 orbifold in terms of brain webs. 
this adding of the white dot, all we know is that, according to Benini, um, Benvenuti Tachikawa, it means letting two brains end on this and getting rid of a little segment that just went off to infinity. So what is our claim? What does this mean? So first of all, let me go back to the type 2a projection. In type 2a, what I told you is that this M theory situation corresponds to type 2a on C2 mod Z3. If I resolve it, I see a sphere here, a sphere here, with uh, uh, one brain occupying this sphere, two brains occupying here, and there are three D6 brains that wrap non-compact holomorphic curve, and the spheres intersect in this pattern. So I could have also drawn it more suggestively like this. I have a sphere, sphere, and I have some divisor that cuts it like that, where I have one D6 brain wrapping this one here, uh, sorry, two here and three here. Now, <clears throat> before, in the examples I gave before of the flop, all I had were non-compact D6 brains. So for the conifold, I had two intersecting non-compact D6 brains. For Reed's pagodas, I had several intersecting D6 brains. Now I have a bunch of non-compacts and a bunch of compact D6 brains. Before, I just focus on the Higgs field living on the non-compact D6 brains. Here, there will be more data. There's a, because there's a quiver, there's, um, there will be some bifundamental strings going from here to here, from here to here, and also some adjoint strings like that, okay? But, sorry. But to simplify this talk, I will only focus on the Higgs living here. Uh, in fact, all this data, all these strings could be encoded into one big, big matrix called the tachyon matrix. I will not explain what that means. But if, if we focus solely on the non-compact D6 brains, let's say that they are wrapping a holomorphic curve that's isomorphic to a, a complex plane of uh, coordinate uh, let's say W, then uh, let me make a slight correction here. Ah, I can't correct here, okay. Um, this is a typo. What I should have here is one over W. So our claim is that this merging of two brains, having them end here, corresponds to activating a nilpotent piece with a pole, one over W. The pole is right here, okay? So this is like a Hitchin pole. And this is a T-brain. Now, why do I say that it's a, why is it a T-brain? Uh, well, because I say so. That's, that's basically the answer, okay? Thank you. Uh, now, more generally, if I have some arbitrary partition that encodes a configuration of white dots, what this will translate to is having a Higgs on, on your non-abelian stack here with a nilpotent VEV that corresponds to that partition. So you know that nilpotent orbits are classified by partitions. So now you might say, well, okay, that was very nice, but then there's no geometric interpretation. Because uh, when you have a nilpotent VEV, its characteristic polynomial does not change. All the Casimirs are zero. So then the uplift of this is still the same geometry that you had before. You will not see any change. So I want to give you change. You all want to see change. So let me see what we can do. Can we learn something more about it? And the answer is we can by studying what Hanani Witten moves do to the system. So if we take this, which corresponds to having one white dot, the fact that I have two brains terminating here allows me to pull this brain through over here to perform this Hanani Witten move, to put it here. If I didn't have both brains ending here, this would not have been possible, at least not in this way. Then there would have been some brain creation here. Can we see this in the type 2a picture? We can. So let me remind you, I had one D6 here, two here, and three here. My claim is that what is happening is that two of the flavor D6 brains are recombining with one D6 brain here, and that when I'm moving it through, they recombine into a single flavor brain 
attached to the leftmost node. So in other words, this quiver gauge theory partially Higgs's down to this one. So this is very reminiscent of, of work that Jonathan um, and others did uh, many years ago, uh, studying chains of SUNs in, in 60 uh, superconformal field theories. Now, can we see this in terms of the Higgs data? We can. So if this no potent VEV corresponds to the white dot, the Hanani Witt move that is possible only because I had this configuration corresponds to switching something along the Slodovy, the transverse direction to the nilpotent orbit. And now this does give rise to a non-trivial deformation of the characteristic equation. So the M-theory uplift of this geometry, which I, I, I'll remind you, is, looks something like this, right? It will now be sensitive to this kind of data. So in this particular example, this geometry, which is originally described by the, the falling hypersurface, gets deformed like that. So we have a non-toric threefold. Yeah. So, so the story is, so this, this is upcoming work, but our claim is that at least now we will be able to study um, for any toric graph, if we want to study putting white dots on a single edge of the polygon, it can be entirely understood in terms of nilpotent orbits and their transfer slices. Um, so with this, I can, I can show you the conclusions. Where's Fabian? No, okay. <laughs> okay, so what is my point? <clears throat> that nilpotent data, gauge theoretic data, encodes interesting non-toric deformations. So, in the 5D SCFT engineering business, it corresponds to looking at white dots and the Hanani Witten deformations that are enabled by them. But if you're not interested in, in uh, non trivial rank theories, but just uh, higher length flops, then this stuff is in direct correspondence with higher length flops, which make for very interesting geometries with higher charged states. And what is missing? as I said, is for now, we only know how to handle one edge at a time. Uh, conceivably, we could handle several white dots uh, by studying different projections. So for instance, I can project this to type 2A on something like this, but I could also pick a different fiber direction and project it to something like that. And I could study white dots one edge at a time and then try to superpose the information of deformations. We don't know whether this is allowed or not. Uh, this is what we'd like to find out. All right, so with that, I will end on time, on schedule. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Yeah. So I just want to understand why did you say that that's for the three parts is the maximum important problem compared to some of the other important problems? Uh, because I say so. <laughs> no, okay. No, I mean, no, so I mean, the, the argument is that, <clears throat> um, let's see, how, how can I explain? So we want a nilpotent, so before I put the position dependent part, I want to activate a nilpotent thing that preserves only an SU2 at the origin, so where W equals zero, okay? So the idea is that if, 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 if this is absent, the geometry will be just the E6, the K3, but instead of having a full E6 algebra, I just have SU2. The, vect the 70 vector multiplet of SU2 which will contain a W plus and minus, it will contain a plus charge, minus charge in Cartan direction. Once we start switching on these angles, we'll split into a, a Cartan U1 and a hyper. And so this is what it means to have a simple flop. I just want to have one sphere. 
I don't want to have different sectors of hypers with different char uh, with, with charge under different U1s. I want a single U1. So in other words, um, the fact that it's this is because it's a commutant of this alpha. This is what will ensure that only one sphere can be blown up by this procedure. Did I answer it, or did I just go in a, like a huge circle of mumbling? <laughs> the latter, okay. Yes. So uh, in general, take your Dinkin graph and put the, the Dinkin labels of the adjoint. So whatever node you picked to apply this procedure to, that label will be the highest possible charge for, for that, uh, right, for that resulting threefold. So, well, so in this case, three, but if, if, if you had eight, it would go up to six, right? And that's as high as it gets. That, that was understood by Dave and uh, Sheldon. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You, you're probably wondering if the in-between charges are present. Uh, let's see. Where Andrea, Marco, uh, Mario, and Andrea, are you there? Maybe you know. Do, you, do we know if they, are all the in-between charges populated? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so of course this is strictly non-compact, so I don't know if, if we had any right to expect any, but I, I know what you're thinking, but I know what you're thinking. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ah, I don't know. Uh, let's see, Andrea probably knows this. No? Do you think? Yeah. Uh, okay, so I mean, one, one way is to use the, the Grotendieck Springer resolution um, to do it differently. Uh, well, I guess you could do the matrix factorization technique, but I don't, I, I don't know of an easy way. Ah, no, well, okay. So, I mean, there, there's a, another way, which is, of course, to, to create the quiver variety for this. Uh, once you have the quiver variety with the appropriate superpotential and everything, then you have the resolution almost by definition of it. Yeah. Sure. And, and the, I mean, the, the, the universal quiver for these things is known. It was found by Joe Karmazin, a mathematician. Yeah. Yeah. You get what? That's true. I don't know how that's seen. I mean, even in the language of Benini, Benvenuti, Tachikawa, I mean, they, they're just studying how the groups of three brains terminate. I don't know if they could have, if in that language you could see different orbits along E6. Can you? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, hmm. Hmm. Well, I mean, so for those cases, right, I have a different, I mean, the, the technology of going to type 2A is not going to show me this stuff. Uh, now, if you mean it more in this language here, the, 
this language, I don't know. What I've done here is looked at um, uh, families of AD surfaces over uh, the complex uh, over a complex plane. So I don't know if it's possible to create uh, these geometries in that language. We have not explored that. So to see them as K3 vibrations. Maybe it's possible to see them as K3 vibrations over some non-trivial, non-compact curve. All right, thank you. Thank you.